It's September 18th, 1837, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. When I was 25, I got a £1,000 loan from my father-in-law and I used it to stage an Edinburgh Fringe production about blogging. We broke even. (laughs) Today in history, 25-year-old Charles Lewis Tiffany took the $1,000 loan he got from his father and made a slightly sounder investment, opening a stationery and fancy goods emporium at 259 Broadway, New York, named initially after himself and his business partners, but as we know it now, the $16 billion jewellery empire, (laughs) Tiffany's. Well, to be fair, a thousand dollars went a lot further in 1837 than it did in your day, Ollie. But nonetheless, it was a bit of a mad time to open a fancy goods store. This was the beginning of the Great Panic of 1837, a huge financial crisis which caused a recession lasting years, leading to businesses closing, prices plummeting, unemployment soared, and around 600 banks collapsed. Still, they managed to keep it afloat. This was Charles Lewis Tiffany and his business partner and school friend and future brother-in-law, John B. Young. They expanded their offering to include all manner of homeware, trinkets, jewellery, as they started to build up a picture of what sold. And one aspect that really worked in their favour in those lean early years was their business-like approach to sales. At the time, shopping for luxury goods was an elite pastime, and the well-to-do minority who could indulge in it were used to being treated with kid gloves. So when Tiffany came along with practices that are now standard, like having set prices to eliminate room for haggling and refusing to extend credit to customers, that was seen as, you know, sharp practice at the time, but Tiffany stuck to their guns and were able to ride out that economic unrest. It is fascinating to look through the things that were sold in early Tiffany's, considering that we now know it very much as a store that sells jewellery, because right at the beginning they sold watches and clocks and bronzers, perfumes, preparations for the skin and hair, dinner sets, moccasins, belts, you know, just there were so many things, including everything down to dog whips. I don't know why you need to whip a dog, (laughs) but I guess they, they knew back in the day in ways that we don't know now. Um, But then they really, so as you say, they really focused in on the things that were selling and part of the success was to do with what an incredible businessman Tiffany was. He was so able to identify exactly where his sales were coming from and really focus on those. Yeah, although not such an incredible businessman on this day, uh, the first day sales total was (laughs) (laughs) $4.98. That would have financed many an Edinburgh show, Ollie. (laughs) (laughs) But what they went on to do absolutely, as you say, is is they kind of defined what was working and actually defined American style Mm. along with the business proposition. You know, simple, clear, classic. And in opposition to the sort of highfalutin... French and British and German styles that are mannered and opulent and historic at this time. Something slightly more casual, but no less luxurious. Something that said, in a kind of American dream sort of way, this is luxury, this is class, but everyone should aspire to be able to have it. And if Mm. you have the money and you walk into Tiffany, you can buy it too. Very different, isn't it, to the kind of... (laughs) British get out of my shop vibe that you'd be getting <laughs> if you weren't aristocracy. <laughs> yeah, by the mid 1840s, the more and more people could afford it. The economy had not only recovered, it was booming. You know, this was the time of railways and canals starting to cross America, huge immigration, manufacturing innovation. More and more people could afford to treat themselves. And something that specifically helped the luxury sector in the US was the fact that this was a time of great unrest across Europe, culminating in what's called the revolutions of 1848. So you had all of the displaced European aristocrats who were suddenly seeking out new homes and were open to flogging the family jewels to finance their new lives. So if you were someone like Charles Tiffany, who appreciated good jewellery, this was a great time to pick up loads of bargains. I mean, kind of ghoulish, but, you know, really raid these dispossessed aristocrats. And that's exactly what he did. So in 1848, Charles Tiffany and his partners actually purchased some of the crown jewels and also a bejeweled corset that was reputed to have belonged to Marie Antoinette after the French monarchy was overthrown. And he was always this incredibly shrewd publicist and you know Tiffany really exploited this coup he actually teamed up with P.T. Barnum and to their mutual profit took on the road this gem studded miniature silver filigree horse and carriage that they set up as a wedding present to Tom Thumb and his bride Tom Thumb being one of Barnum's uh, great stars. Yeah I mean it's fascinating isn't it that connection with Barnum because there is an element of the showman in what Tiffany did Uh, even just you know you think of Tiffany still and you think of the colour 
don't you? The, the robin's egg mm. colour. Um, that's something that they patented fairly early, but was used for brand building and promotion by the turn of the 20th century. Uh, in 1906, the New York Sun reported, quote, Tiffany, and this was his son, Tiffany, Tiffany has one thing in stock that you cannot buy off him for as much money as you may offer. He will only give it to you, and that is one of his boxes. Mm. The rule of the establishment is ironclad, never to allow a box bearing the name of the firm to be taken out of the building, except with an article which has been sold by them and for which they are responsible. They were very, very clear on brand building and associating that name with quality and that colour with luxury. Yeah, and nowhere more so than in the Blue Book. This was Tiffany's catalogue that they introduced in 1845, precisely when things were starting to take off for them. Essentially, it was the first mail-order retail catalogue. There had been catalogues before, but they were basically just printed lists of what's for sale. They were commonly used for buying seeds or books, things like that. The Blue Book, in contrast, was a sensory experience in itself. You know, it, over the years, especially, it became an increasingly opulent vehicle for telling stories, creating the, our narrative around them and around the Tiffany's brand. And crucially, it was way to market the brand to the wider public you know rather than just that tiny new york based elite on the front of the catalog there was a strap line that said cash wholesale purchasers who may suppose they will be asked higher prices in broadway than anywhere are invited to test the truth of their supposition so basically you know reaching out hmm. to the small town shop owners saying look you might think that we're prohibitively expensive but take a look you'll find we're not that's not a marketing message they've stuck with is it no it really <laughs> isn't <laughs> whilst they'd had this new accessible luxurious style in america they were also getting respect in the home of fine jewellery and accessories. You know, they were at the Paris World's Fair in 1867, where Tiffany's was awarded the grand prize for silver craftsmanship, and also making real waves in jewellery design, most notably in 1886, when Tiffany created the six-prong setting. Now, that is basically when you think of an engagement ring, what you think of. Instead of framing a stone with bezels on either side, which obscure the gem they displayed the gem solo atop a band and essentially lift a diamond up further towards your face when you're looking at a lady's hand. Well, Charles Tiffany wasn't infallible when it came to assessing gems. He did become one of the famous victims of the Great Diamond Hoax of 1872, along with luminaries like Civil War generals George McClellan and Benjamin Butler and the newspaper magnate Horace Greeley. This scheme involved diamonds supposedly discovered in the West of America, but actually they were low-quality manufacturing offcuts, essentially, bought up from European cutters by conmen Philip Arnold and John Slack, so they had all these investors buying into the scheme, you know, thinking that there were diamonds in the Colorado desert. Eventually, when the investors demanded to see one of the, you know, one of the deposits, they planted gems in the Colorado desert and then brought them all out there so they could discover them. <laughs> this went amazing. on for some time. And Tiffany's role was particularly humiliating because of his overvaluing of some of those early specimens that weren't actually priceless gems at all. They were just, yeah, manufacturing offcuts. That had drawn in even more high profile investors to be duped because they thought, well, Tiffany thinks it's legitimate, so it must be. So it was a really embarrassing situation for him. But I think the connection that Tiffany was able to make between sort of America as a fledgling nation and um, his brand overcame any setbacks like that, you know, very cleverly associating uh, as a company with celebrities long before the days of Lady Gaga at the Oscars. You know, President Lincoln purchased a seed pearl suite for Mary Todd Lincoln in 1861. FDR got a Tiffany engagement ring in 1904. Tiffany China was used at White House dinners. It was Tiffany who redesigned the Great Seal of the United States, making the eagle's legs more muscular. Wow. And that is still the version of the seal that's on the back of a $1 bill. Gosh, I found another <laughs> fascinating connection, which was that in 1877, Tiffany's created a police medal of honour for a New York police officer with an interlocking N and Y. And it's now the famous Yankees symbol. The yeah. Yankees just picked it up and ditched their old uh, American flag top hat symbol. And that became the symbol for New York, which arguably re represents like the city, which is the country. You know, it's just this massive association between Tiffany's itself and the United States. Do you think anyone buying a Yankees cap is like, yes, but do you have it in Robin's Egg Blue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. There's a curse of Tutankhamun, so there must be some kind of curse around this <laughs> it one. Is like All that. mummies have curses. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. 
patreon.com slash retrospectors.